Now, welcome to Let's Talk Some Mando, where this time it is the season three opener, The Apostate. Yes. Which means major, major spoilers ahead. And as usual, we'll begin with your ever so brief review of the episode. It's hard to do this briefly. Quickest overview I can say is I was epically disappointed. Epically? Well, they kept hyping up how the season's going to be epic. Every one of the actors in the interview said, epic, epic, epic. This didn't feel epic. This felt like the episode where you just run around, talk to everybody to remind everybody where we are. But I don't think people all needed that reminder. They have these catch-up recap videos. Let's just move forward. Let's move forward to the plot that we thought we were getting. Yeah, I, I agree. This did feel kind of like a letdown. No, I don't think it was bad. No, like, not bad. Like in today's world, it's either like, oh, it was phenomenal or you must have hated it. it it's, not, it's not always that, right? Because I thought it was... A, good i enjoyed it mm -hmm. but like you said I, I was expecting more i expected progression now that we've had two years with no mandalorian season well i mean book of boba fett yes. kind of was a mini season and it really was i mean that's a joke but it's not entirely wrong But if you think about it episode five of book of boba fett the mandalorian episode was better than this that's <laughs> Did you watch my review or are you just pulling that out? Because that's what I said. The pro oh. One of the big problems was those Book of Boba Fett episodes are really, really good. Plot progression, major character development, all these things mm -hmm. happen in that. And then you get the first episode of the actual season and it's kind of like, pump the brakes, nothing really major is going to happen. Well, what's disappointing the most to me is we got all of these side quests. I know you called them side quests. <laughs> yeah, so I'm I made them the, side quests. I made the video game comparison in my yes. review, yes. We picked up the, I need to find a chip because I need to fix a robot because I want to go to Mandalore because I need to prove myself and I'm going to go visit bo and she's lost faith. We got all of these side quests, but we still have threads from the earlier seasons that I want to see. Exactly. What happened exactly with Moff Gideon? We know he's going to be back. Well, they tease him. He gets name dropped. Yeah. He's facing a new Republic War Tribunal. Yes. We have the plot thread of what's Pershing up to. Which was teased in the trailer, yeah. The plot thread of... Grogu's blood and Grogu's history. Yep. We have the current quest of Mando going to Mandalore and all that good stuff. The future of the Covert, the future of the Darksaber, Bo-Katan's future. It felt like, I agree. All they did was pile more. Yes, it felt like going into the season we had a lot to cover and only eight episodes. And you know the show tends to be shorter per episode. So you're like, mm -hmm. wow, how are they going to jam all this in there? And then you get this episode and you're like, they're taking extra side quests. He's, he's going, as I said in my review, he's filling up his quest log to do other things. Yeah, and where's my looming darkness? Your looming darkness? Yes, the, the big overshadowing thing that the New Republic is afraid of, the Captain oh, see, that's what Carson I... Tiva's been hinting. Yeah, it just felt like... We have enough on our plate, we didn't need... Get a new robot! I don't want Tycho Watiti back. Just go visit Melly. Wow. She's got that cute you, you little BD say, droid. Take that with us. You didn't even say IG-11. You said Psycho with TT. Yeah, I'm a little frustrated with him after Thor Love and Thunder. Fair enough. Just visit Pelly, borrow the cute little BD droid, and let's go. Sure. Then it'll fit in your ship because your ship won't even hold an IG-11. Ah. Uh. <laughs> ship's too small <laughs> to hold Grogu uh, and I. I mean, I guess Grogu damn. would have to come and... Wait, is he just going to fold him up back there? It'll be fine. Because They'll figure it remember, out. Remember, the space Grogu in is the space for an astromech you could just attach so him to the he hood fits but no it's not stupid just strap no. him on you know how they do it maybe we should actually get to the comments yeah i know we've been i i think and look hey a lot of the comments too are probably going to be more complaints and i i understand there's people who don't want to you know hear about complaints but i think there's good things to be discussed and uh, we will things. discuss some of them for sure but i think there were a lot of people frustrated with this episode so we will get to some probably more frustrated comments on very positive ones apologies Let's kick it off with the top-rated one, though. From Verilit Torf. I feel like Grogu has overstayed his welcome in this show. Season 2 should have been his permanent departure. That was the top comment currently when I clipped him, so apparently a lot of people agree with that, and I wouldn't say I disagree with that either. I don't know about permanent departure, but it I should have been yes. an extended leave of absence. It would have been interesting had he come back later in the season with the Pershing storyline, Yes. Maybe, maybe that man, maybe Grogu was on his way back to Mando and he got intercepted by the remnants or something or Pershing or the New Republic's like, hey, we need this kid. And they try to like come in as the government to be like, hey, we're taking this from him from you. He's actually now going to be New Republic property. We need him. What I don't do know. Luke would do? That would be an interesting storyline for Luke. Like if they somehow needed Grogu and they came and tried to take him. Kind of reminds me of that Star Trek episode with Data where they, the, 
mm-hmm. Federation kind of wanted to take. It's one of the best episodes of Star Trek Next right. Generation. Anyway, something like that could have been pretty interesting, actually. Right. I think they needed more time apart. I think Mando needed to start his quest, maybe without the kid. Yes. It, it feels like the Book of Boba Fett should have been, like, the mid-season, like, epic episodes, right? Of this season of The Mandalorian, where you start... I would have been okay with this episode if if you remove Grogu and just kind of see what he's up to without Grogu. He kind of set the, the foundation. Okay, well, he still would have needed the Book of Boba Fett stuff. It, it's, you still it's so it. Yeah, it's so confusing because mm-hmm. you feel like some... Again, you feel like this epic stuff happened in Book of Boba Fett, and now we're kind of dealing with the repercussions of it in his own show. And not to mention reiterating a lot of it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Maybe Grogu will get handled better throughout the season. We'll see. Well, I think we have some comments about that, too, coming up. Next comment is from Emperor Cubone. I guess they just wanted Mando to look cool, but having the rest of the Mandalorians get bodied by a random gator is not something to get me invested in them taking their homeworld back. No wonder they lost if that's how they fight. This comment goes along with John Pendleton. A thought came to me. Maybe the people that abandoned her, some anyways, joined the armor. I know Bo said they became mercenaries. Maybe not all did that. Yeah, I think this leads to a lot of interesting questions. Like, where did they get so many new recruits in such a short amount of time? I was tempted, and I haven't, to look back at season one to see if any of those Mandalorians match any of these Mandalorians. The covert was big. We know a lot of them died, but the rest of them probably scattered. Yeah. I'm sure they didn't all perish. They're well, supposed yeah, to she be said, cool and badass. Yeah, she said she hopes some got away. Mm-hmm. So some of these might be from there. We've also probably picked up some new recruits. Maybe the ones who got away just kind of held tight and started their own little coverts while they waited. Yeah, I kind of thought that one of the reasons why they do get kind of owned by the Gator is these aren't exactly fully trained, hardcore Mandalorians. These are, you know, we, we got to maybe scrape the bottom of the barrel to get the ranks, you know, replenished. I know that sounds bad, but... I don't think these were, you know, you saw past Vizsla. He was out there like, you know, get inside. I've got this guy. You know, he was doing everything. He was the leader, man. So, yeah, he was the leader. And I think he's pretty much the only, like, real Mandalorian they got right now. I mean, some of the other ones were flying around in jetpacks and doing things. But I don't know that this was the, the A-team, if you will. It just didn't feel like real Mandalorians because how long have they, A, how long have they been on this planet that they didn't know there was a gator? <laughs> the, B, yes. how did none of them realize we should attack the underside and not attach detonators to its yeah. shell? Yeah, go for the hard part at the top. No, probably not the smartest move there. No. I was very confused. I'm like, okay, yeah, we got the thermal detonators. I'm like, what are you guys putting them on the shelf for? Yeah, their tactics that would in general. Be the were worst off. pot to put them. Yeah, I agree. In general, this was kind of a one of those when you really you know, you're like, Oh, cool action, but then you're like, Why are they fighting this giant gator and getting owned? So if Mando wouldn't have shown up, that would have been the end of the covert. Yes, I guess so. Because apparently they could not defend themselves against a native species of the planet they live on. I mean, in their defense, it's a giant gator. Yeah, it's not exactly it like this was a small alli- you know, a small alligator roaming around. The water and they're like, oh, what do we do? But why, yeah. why didn't they all launch their rockets? Shouldn't they all have rockets Something. in there? I mean, when you look at it story-wise, you step back and say it was all about giving Mando a dramatic entrance. And in the process, they forgot about making the other Mandos look bad. Well, in season one, on the Battle of Navarro, when they all showed up and just started dist- decimating all those people, that was exciting when they were yes. taking out the, the guild bounty hunters who were going after yeah, one of their didn't... own. That yeah. was like, look at them. They're badass. They're cool. Then we found out a bunch of stormtroopers smoked half of them, and I was like, okay, well, that's a little <laughs> depressing. They're very inconsistent. And then they're like, oh, by the way, this alligator, yeah, it's going to smoke them too. Yeah, giant alligator turtle thing. Because it yeah. did have like a shelly, shelly? A shelly thing on the back? I think someone I think, in the Discord called it, a, um, I think yeah, Argo called it a turtle gator. Yeah. Turtle gator? Turtle gator. Turtle gator. Yep. I like that. Next comment from Josh Lapla. It's funny how bo loves the Darksaber and its symbolism when it's in her hands, yet hates its power when others have it, like Maul and Din. This comes up again when Din Djarin points out her double standards when she talks about the superstitions of Death Watch, yet she calls Mandalore cursed. She's really only interested in what gets her power. Mm, I can't completely argue with that. I feel like she needs to join the way. I know that sounds might sound weird. I feel like she would really benefit from joining the cult of fanatics, as she put. Well, one of the things the episode does establish is that the cult of fanatics is growing, whereas the moment she doesn't have power to wield in front of them, as she even says, just wave it around and they'll follow you like sheep, essentially, mm-hmm. they leave. That shows with the Mandalorians that she had following her have no code. 
They have no yeah. ethics except to follow power. No real honor. Right. Whereas we get to see throughout the opener of the episode that the Mandalorians that follow the way, they're not there because they're following power. They're there because they're following a community and a set of ideals that they very strongly believe in. Yeah. During the, the gator fight, anytime any Mando went down in the water, another one ran in to help. Even the armorer, who is a very prominent member of this society, what happens if they lose the person who can forge their armor? Is there an apprentice trait? Is, can someone pick up the slack? Yet she had no problem wading in and trying to help. Yeah, I thought she was going to Legolas the gator. You did. I was like, oh God, she's going to Legolas. Because she ran in there with the two, I don't know, she's going to climb that thing and like just hack it apart. And I'm like, No, really? she was running in nah, there she to she save got somebody. Immediately, and then, yeah, yeah. And immediately she's going to take a strike and it's bam. But no, you bring up a good point about the armor. That Those are the kind of things I wanted explored more in the season. Like. Yeah. How important is she? Is she kind of like a religious figure? Is she just an armorer who happens to know a lot of stuff? Or what is her kind of role in Mandalorian society? Let's explore those things. Let's well, not if fight giant gators. If we weapons are the religion, as Mando said, and their armor is pretty much a weapon. Yeah. She is the religious leader. She forges their holy weapons. <laughs> Well, you do get the impression she's not, like, the leader. I mean, she might be the de facto default leader at this point. Yes. But I don't think she's meant to be the leader of the Mandalorian. She's, again, more of a spiritual figure is what it feels like. Yeah. She's not... So She's part of, like, the leader of the community, but I think Paz Vizsla fills the other half of that role. Yes. He's the, the war leader. He's the fighting leader. He's the one who trains them for battle. She's the one who dresses them for battle and reminds them about how important it is to follow the creed. Yeah. They he have was their so parts. Yeah, he was so proud of the the foundling. If you he really was. watch that, he's you know he's kind of getting his little nods, his head a couple of times. Like, yeah, this this is the boy. He's going to be a new yes, a new Mando, very, and I'm proud very of him. Proud, and I, yeah, it's I cool. love that he goes to save him later. Yeah, it's weird that the best character progression in the episode might have been Paz Vizsla nodding right. his head and being proud for about thirty seconds. Because we kind of got left in the book of Boba Fett thinking he's kind of a yeah. jerk because he went after the power of the dark saber. Yeah, maybe he's corrected since then and been like. Why am I chasing the power of that relic? I have power here with my community. Yeah. I can be more important. I can be an actual leader, not just because I have the Darksaber, but because I'm an actual leader. Well, and it's, it's so ridiculous how Bo talks about the Darksaber, really. She's a hypocrite. She's talking about how powerful and it's a symbol in it, and it, I need this, and it's so powerful. But then she's like, yeah, wave around the folly like sheep. Yeah, she knows the truth. Yeah. Well, she walked away from when Maul won it from Previsla. She's like, ah. Yeah. Yeah, she you don't deserve away. that. You're not She's a real Mandalorian. No better than the children of the Watch. Then in her own her own She's, eyes, she is uh, yes. a Death Watch member. Yeah, she was. She was in one of those kind of offshoot cults, wasn't she? Let's see. Death Watch, Children of the Watch. I'm gonna go with they're yeah. related. It's she's very. It's a very interesting character, very hypocritical, and I hope intentionally so. Yes, because I hope there's a point to all this. I think now that we've gotten her down to her lowest, where she's lost faith in everything, is where the creed and the way of the Mandalore could actually revitalize her. But we'll yes. see. We'll see. I think that's her story arc. I, I agree with you that she's probably going to. Or I don't will know she about just be going after the dark I don't know. Maybe she's a, just another tragic, you know, character in the story of Star Wars. It could we'll be. See. All right, next comment is from Greg Stella. He can't be fixed, so we made him into a statue. These guys can definitely fix him. <laughs> also, could they please explain why it seems impossible to just take a quick trip to Mandalore and send a probe down to the surface or whatever? How could they possibly not know the condition of the planet? I found this episode frustrating. The dialogue and pacing were off, as if they spliced scenes together and never watched the finished episode. This comment goes along with... F. McPherson, you can tell that they had some very difficult editing decisions to make with this episode, and they probably didn't really get it right. I agree. It felt very disjointed in a way when you consider the episode opens with Mando arriving at the, the covert and like, mm -hmm. how can I get back into the club? And she kind of reiterates how he can do that. And he's even got this little artifact that perhaps proves things can still exist on Mando or whatever. Yes. And then at the end of the episode, he's like, Bo-Katan, I want to join you. Wait, what? He only wants to join her because she's got this plan to retake Mandalore. Yes. So he's kind of trying to use her. But he should finish his mission first, right? Shouldn't he just... I mean, why is he using her? Like, we don't even know that the, the Covert has any interest in going back to Mandalore. No. They seem to be... I mean, what, what that opening says to me is home is, you know, where the heart is kind of thing, right? They don't care about... It's not a physical location as much as it is the people around you that make a home. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the... 
I, I feel like that's the difference here. That's one of the things that the Covert seems to get right, whereas the other Mandalorians are like, we got to retake Mandalore, even though it's a glass poisoned rock floating in space at this point. Could they need Mandalore? If Beskar can maybe only be found there, maybe they need to get back there to try and mine it. Maybe they need to get more armor made. Well, is it being protected? Is it being, I if mean, the po- or guarded? The glass, if the planet is actually glassed and poisoned and the Empire has marked it that way and everyone sees it that way. But the Empire is gone. Right. But think about what they did in Andor. The planet was marked as inhospitable, so nobody went there. Yes, but that doesn't stop people from actually, as we see, Marva and Clem. Marva and Clem go there because a detector. ship crashed there, and they're going after the ship. Yeah. If no other ship crashes there, do you think many people are going to explore a planet they think could actually kill them by landing on it? Well, my it's, point is, what is actually stopping, as the comment points out, what is stopping somebody from plopping into probe. orbit? We, we probe droids exist in Star Wars, mm-hmm. throwing a probe droid down the planet. Seeing if there's radiation, seeing if there's poison. I mean, if the thing gets irradiated instantly and doesn't transmit back, okay, the planet's probably screwed. But you can you could certainly take some samples. I don't I don't really. Well, somebody did. Well, yeah, but I mean, I don't understand like what is like physically stopping anybody from going to Mandalore and just like checking it out. Well, what if part of it is because if you don't know where the mines are, it's no good for you. I mean, if the planet is glassed on the surface just by looking at it and it's covered in the fusion plasma green glass, it's not going to look like there's anything even there for you to get at. Well, sure. Again, but my point is until yes. you actually go there to physically look and check it out, which... You're not, though, yeah. Yeah, which I don't think anything is stopping you. I think the New Republic is setting up like a blockade of cruisers when they can barely patrol the outer rim. So what it, what in the world is going on there? And why is it so hard to just go there and look? And why do we need IG-11? <laughs> uh, we don't. I, I, I agree know, with he, this. He can't be fixed, so he's a statue, but then he can be fixed. Uh, I mean, he got blown up, right? He had a thermal detonator in his chest cavity care. that exploded, which in theory would just kind of and render yet him his chest bits cavity and pieces. seems to be fine. Yeah. It was his legs and an arm that are missing. Yeah. Chest cavity fine, head Maybe fine. Maybe the explosion no, went downward. No, that doesn't. Don't try and make too much sense. Hey, somebody's got to do it. Gonna. But yes, I found the editing in this actually it was... rough as well. I did. It felt very disjointed. It felt like they had some bits and pieces and they just kind of wanted to mm-hmm. put them together. Well, one thing that frustrated me to no end, and I I did the math, I've counted it over and over and over again, uh, Davy Jones' swamp thing, Yeah. the Pirate King, he yells at Mando, you killed four of my fighters. I'm like, what? What, what do you mean four? He killed five. He yeah. blew up five ships. I counted them at least three times. I was like, okay, six ships chasing. One makes it out, and you can literally see on screen every one of those ships get hit by Mando. Still only counts as four. No, it's five. And then I was like, well, maybe he's talking about that there were, you know, people on, in the... On Navarro, yeah. Yeah, the, maybe the people on Navarro, maybe he's counting those. And I went back to the scene and I looked at them like, nope, there were six of them, and Vane was the only one who made it, which means five again. Still only counts as no, four. No, So somehow the dialogue and the editing is just... I'm like, did you not yes. remember you left all five ship deaths in there? Or did you not remember yes. how many people were there? It's five. That is a editing error where the visual effects people... Well, the visual effects people would also have to work on Swamp Thing, Captain, Ooh. whatever. So, just very strange. Necessary. I mean, it's not a big deal, but you did notice it and you're right. Next comment comes from KLOB. Not gonna lie, the Purgle part was my favorite. And the space battle, too, but damn. Love those space whales. Yeah, I actually, I think it was one of my favorite parts too. Again, I didn't hate this episode. I was so I know, excited seeing them. Yeah, I know we're like talking, you know, nitpicking it and talking about what we don't like or what was wrong with it, but I didn't hate it. And I actually, there were parts I enjoyed. The Perga was a really nice little reference to mm-hmm. Rebels and Ahsoka series potentially and what happened to Ezra, a little reminder like, hey, he's out there somewhere. Plus, seeing them in live action could be really cool. We rewatched the Rebels episode. Yeah. Because it's been so long since I saw the Pergil and I really wanted to reference them again. It's They're so interesting as a species. When we first see them, they're kind of gray, looking very whale-like. They dive through the unrefined fuel, and then that's when they pick up, their eyes start glowing, their colors come out. They turn, yeah. like, bright purple and, and orange. And I was like, dang, that's really cool. That is cool. So, yeah, Pergil. Pergil. We saw them. So did Grogu. Not yeah. enough people are talking about Pergil. We'll, I think we'll, a lot of we'll people talk are talking about, about Pergil. Pergil. Oh, I'm sure we'll talk more about Pergil because everybody loves Pergil. Mm-hmm. Even I, though I remember when the episode came out, everybody's like, really? Space Willis? Really? Uh, why not? <laughs> 
But no, I, it's another one of those things that adds a little bit more flavor to Star Wars, so I'm kind of cool with it. Next comment from George Mitchell. This season should have baby Yoda fully transition to young Grogu. Develop him as a full character, have him speak, and face two choices. This goes along with Valkana Nublet. I think they made a mistake using Yoda's species for Grogu. They should have used some other species that's still cute, but more human-like aging. Even if it means inventing a new species. The problem with a species like Yoda's that ages so slowly is really that it's hard to do character progression. Even a few more seasons, he's still gonna be baby Grogu. By the time Grogu's old enough to be doing stuff on his own, Din is going to be old or dead. If they had a human-like aging character, then a crying toddler in season one, episode one, could be a walking, talking kid by now. Yeah, I think they kind of backed themselves into a corner with Grogu. Because now we've gotten to the point where, I mean, the top comment is, you know, they should have jettisoned him and not brought him back. And I think a lot of people echo that sentiment of like, okay, he's, we've done the cute baby thing. So now let's do something else. But it's very hard to explain how like one day he's going to be Goo Goo Gaga and the next day he's going to be even a toddler. You know, even walking and kind of talking. I think the regression comes from memory loss, honestly. Think about it. He was training at the temple in Coruscant. Ahsoka told us that he was training. Yeah. They aren't training somebody who can't comprehend who is a total baby. Yes. I mean, they take you when you're a young child, but they're not like, okay, little one-year-old, here's the Force. I know you can't speak or comprehend, but I'm going to teach you about the Force. Grogu is old enough to know. He's, I think, regressed because of whatever memory loss has happened, and I feel like the more he remembers, maybe the more we'll see the true Grogu come out, one that can comprehend. Even if he can't speak speak, he, comprehension and behavior could be a little more mature. I agree that's probably their best course of action to imply that it's not that they age as slowly as it is that he's repressing. He's repressing, which he's regressing, he's psychologically as, yeah, damaged. As you said, and both Luke was also, it's not that I'm teaching him as much as he's remembering. So we're going to learn that now it doesn't take 100 years for a Yoda species, quote unquote, to go from baby to toddler stage as much as he's, you know, he's the exception. He's been through a rough life and he is acting like a baby still. Mm-hmm. Which, I don't know if that shatters the illusion of Baby Yoda and hurts toy sales, but I think that's I think that's their best course of action at this point. I think so. Next comment, not yours, 2012. I'm really disappointed in the run times of these episodes. I understand we aren't guaranteed anything, but when you look elsewhere in the industry, The Last of Us and The Boys, these lengths are just pitiful. I really want to be able to dig into an episode each week. This comment goes with Ritsan. I don't understand how HBO with The Last of Us could give us a movie-length episode for the first episode of that, and we get 30 minutes for this. Even Andor episodes were longer. Yeah, I think Andor was intentionally meant to be something different, where this is intentionally meant to be something more, for better or worse, something a little bit more kind of surface-level fun. Not that there's no depth to this at all, but it's not Andor, which kind of... You know, after how good Andor was, or how good I thought Andor was, it's kind of hard to go back to the, you know, the longest conversation we see in this is like a minute long, and it's very exposition heavy. There's very, very few times in the show, I mean, I, I would love to people to go back and try to remember, like, what is the longest conversation you ever even see in this? Whereas a show like The Last of Us, you can have a 10 minute conversation. Your whole episode could be conversation. Yeah, and it doesn't make it bad. No. I mean, I can understand why people don't like that kind of entertainment. Which is why I don't think the show is that. I think the show is purposely trying to go, 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 you know, move. Because they think that's what Star Wars is. They and need to trust in the attention span of their audience. Yeah, I, I, I look, I, I think, I, I don't mind what the Mandalorian tries to do being a little bit quicker paced like that. Because I do think if you watch A New Hope or, you know, you go back old school Star Wars, it's pretty quick paced. You don't see long conversations in Star Wars. But I think you could find a, a balance between the two. I think we could stand a little bit longer, more in-depth, character-driven conversations here. Well, if they need to entertain you, they can. you can watch Baby Grogu do something cute while they're having a talk conversation. Well, that's kind of what they do anyway, isn't it? Yeah, I'm just saying, we'll, we'll watch Baby Grogu for a while. Well, yeah, but just I mean... <laughs> make sure you give us the exposition that we need to make this story good. Well, they're giving us the exposition, but they don't give you that extra stuff. Like, And it mm. oftentimes feels like exposition, like... Mando goes to speak to the armorer, and we get a 
you know, this is an artifact from Mandalore. Mandalore is glassed. Oh, well then, should I, do I have to go back there to become a Mandalore? You know, it's very like, and I'm not saying these two are going to have like, oh, so how's it been? You want a cup of coffee? No, they don't, sit down? they don't talk that way. No, they don't talk that way. But there are, there are times when you could give us an extra minute and maybe just flesh it out a little bit more, make it feel a little more natural instead of like, here we are just trying to convey information. That's, that's how a lot of the scenes in the Mandalorian feel. We're just trying to convey the plot point so we can move to the next plot point. Like Karga and Din getting together in this episode, you could have taken another minute or two and made it feel a little more chit chatty, right? Because grief cargo is a he's a you know he's a talker right yes he's a people's person he could have you know he could have had a little bit more to say there and it just it feels like a lot of times we were just he was busy taking making the minimal. a sales pitch though yeah which he could have tried to butter him up more mm-hmm. next comment comes from Ziggy it feels silly for Mando to want to revive IG Eleven just so he has an ally he can trust why not just ask Boba Fett for help he certainly owes Mando that goes with Ryan Dodrill. I know it's a droid, so it's a bit different, but I can't help but feel like we're back to the same old problem. No one ever stays dead in Star Wars. No, I, I agree. We're talking about moving characters out of the story. I mean, IG-11 isn't alive, right? He could technically, since he's a droid, be put back together and come back in pretty much any condition, which is what yeah. they're implying. But it's about characters actually leaving the story and having that sense of loss of a character, right? Well, and I think bringing IG-11 is the worst choice. Well, IG-11 is a bounty hunter, mercenary, killer droid, right? Or at least he was. He needs an analysis droid. He needs something that's going to actually be able to get all the readings on the atmosphere, pick up readings on this and that, to see if things are poison or things are dangerous. And, I mean, maybe IG-11 can do that, but that's not what he is programmed to do. That's not what he's designed to do. Bring along a computer droid, you know, like an astromech or a protocol droid. Heck, if you want to visit Boba Fett, borrow his little bunny rabbit bot. He, it's, he still has it. It was at the very end of the season. There are different droids that can do that. Go to, go to visit Pelly. She has a BD-1 droid. Yeah. She's got all those cute little pit droids. Yes, the pit droids, again, are not designed for this. She has the R5 unit we know he's going to be visiting with. There are droids that are more suitable for the task he seems to want it for. I don't think he wants to take the droid with for protection. I think he wants it to help analyze the environment to make sure it's safe. Well, yeah, in theory, there should be... It's a canary. Yeah, the canary in the coal mine, exactly. Mm -hmm. But in theory, there should be, like, nothing alive down there, right? I mean, we know there's going to be, but... Mm -hmm. But you also brought up the point right after we watched the episode, one of the first things you said is, well, didn't he have his entire memory erased? Didn't, like... Didn't Quill have to start from, like, square one because everything was gone? Mm -hmm. So how did he default back to programming that Quill removed? I don't understand it at all. <sighs> Droid couldn't even pick up a cup. No, exactly. Yeah, he couldn't walk. He couldn't pick up a cup because he had to go back to square one. And yet here he is crawling around the floor, moving and stuff. I mean, I guess he could have pulled that off even without the right programming. But I don't know. I don't it's know. It's one of those things where it's... I'm not a droid smith. <laughs> no, you're not. The memory chip was broken, so he doesn't have the memories of Quill's reprogramming. But somehow the original programming is still there underneath everything. Yeah, but Quill kind of assured that couldn't happen, right? One of the memory chip is broken, the default programming would just be, I'm a bounty hunter droid, wouldn't it? Why is the yeah. default programming to, to he has kill memory, Grogu? Yes. Why does he still have memory to kill Grogu if he's just went back to his default? Because of the memory chip. Unless he was just trying to kill anything and he just... No. no because he even... I don't know, man. Sometimes... Grogu was his target. He went for Grogu. <sighs> Sometimes. Don't think about it. I have to. That's what I do. Final comment comes from Andre Nitro X 1000 the first two seasons had strong first episodes, and this one felt like it had more filler than laying down the road for the Mandalore arc. Still, I was pleased by what I saw, and I will be excited for the next episode. Yeah. I am still excited for the next episode. <laughs> I don't want this negative talk to me. I'm not excited to see where this is going. Like I said before we got into this, and again, I know there's going to be people in the comments, oh, why are you focusing? I thought it was okay. I thought it was pretty good. But the, unfortunately, it wasn't It wasn't as good as it should have been. But it I'm could flat be out. It could be better. Like, there's there's more that could have been done with this episode, I, I think. Maybe the actors overhyped us right away, kept screaming how epic this was going to be, and then this is what we got. And I'm like, okay, that wasn't epic to me. No, it didn't feel... I mean, if they mean epic in terms of, like, big battles, okay, then I guess it was epic. Especially for The Mandalorian, where we haven't seen a ton of action. Where you might get one big kind of action set piece per episode, and this one we got, like, two. We got the space battle, 
We got the Gator battle. So I guess it was more epic in that respect. But what I think people were expecting is right away to get thrown into the main story, like deep into the main story. Like something was going to happen in this episode where we're going to be like, wow, this story's taking off. Things are happening. I can't wait for next week. And I don't think we got that. I think they need a redo on this episode. I mean, there are a lot of theories out there that say what happened is, you know, they took what was supposed to be Mandalorian Season 3 and they threw it in the Book of Boba Fett. And I, I don't disagree that something like that probably happened. That kind of feels that way. Yeah, and I feel like this opening episode pays the price for the Book of Boba Fett having Mandalorian Season 2.5 in it and it being epic and really good. Mm -hmm. All right, well, that is all we got for you this time. It was a bit of a talk this time, I think. I don't even want to look at the runtime, but... If you made it this far, thanks for watching and take to the comments below and tell us what you thought of this episode. Did you like it? Did you not like it? What was good? What was bad? Again, whatever the case may be, leave those comments below. Let's talk some Star Wars. And until next time, thanks for watching.